Today, I wanna to show you how to take honey and turn it into a super crushable, carbonated traditional mead at home. So let's get started. So we are taking, in this circumstance, raspberry blossom honey and turning it into a carbonated mead that's gonna be roughly about 6.5% ABV. You don't have to use specifically raspberry blossom honey. You could use clover, wildflower, orange blossom, really any honey in the whole universe. There are some that are gonna be better for this, honestly, um, but you could really use any honey you want. So I wanna teach this in two ways. We're gonna teach a, since it's carbonated, a kegged version, which you don't have to have a ton of stuff to do kegging, and a bottle carbonated version. So the video is gonna have both kinds of recipes and I'll have both recipe cards available for you to see, but it's really not too hard of a process, so let's get started. To start, we're gonna take and get all of our equipment. We're gonna sanitize a carboy or a bucket or whatever you wanna to use to ferment in. The recipe card you're seeing on screen, or you will see on screen, is for a one gallon version of this. If you're doing more, obviously you just multiply, I'm doing a large batch of this, like five or six gallons, so you'll see a larger batch coming from me. We sanitize all of our equipment, and we go ahead and we start blending together our honey, our water, our yeast. I'm actually using an ale yeast, specifically. I'm using the Saf Ale US05, which is notably used in beers. It's a good yeast, so don't, don't discredit beer yeast. You could use whatever you want, wine yeast, cider yeast, stuff like that, but I like this one. That's why it's on the card. We go ahead and mix together honey water, yeast, and our wine tannin, which I used about 1.7 grams of wine tannin for five gallons. So that's roughly gonna translate to like two grams, 2.5 grams-ish for your one gallon there. After we've mixed all of that together, we take a gravity reading, which is with your hydrometer. I encourage you to get one. So you can measure how much sugar is present at the beginning and end of fermentation. So at the beginning of this fermentation, we're setting at roughly, I believe, at 1.050 starting gravity. That's correct. Just double checking my notes that I'm right. 1.050 starting gravity with all of our sugars present. After fermentation, we're gonna see this end at about 1.000. Plug it into an ABV calculator and that will get us to a 6.5% ABV, but we're not there yet. Mixed it all up, add all of those things, put your lid on, write down everything you just did somewhere on it so you remember what happened and put it away to ferment. Put it in a you know, room temp situation here. You don't wanna to go too hot or too cold with like USO5. If you're using a more hot temperature yeast like Kvike Voss or any of the Kvike strains, you can ferment outside or with a heat wrap or something like that. I am choosing to add my Fermade O, which is a yeast nutrient at the 24 hour mark instead of all up front. So once the 24 hour mark hits, I took my, my uh, two grams per gallon of Fermade O and pitched it right into this brew. It will uh, kind of get a little volcano-y, so just be careful when you do this. Mixed all of that in and we walked away again. Fermentation time is gonna be roughly about two weeks, let's say on this. It could be a little slower, could go faster. Two weeks is a rough estimate for you. So about two weeks later, you're going to take and get another sample of your brew and float your hydrometer in it so that you can see the, the gravity after fermentation. If that number is not 1.000 at this specific strength, uh, you're probably gonna wanna let it set. Your brew should go to 1.000 after it's done fermenting. If not, give it some more time. So our brew has sat uh, for two weeks and fermented. You'll probably see it clear up a little bit, maybe not. You can go ahead now and rack it into a new container. So we're gonna do that with an auto siphon and tubing. If you need equipment, there's a link in the description where you can go to some Amazon affiliate side to get equipment for brewing. It goes to support the channel if you wanna do that. We rack it into a new container. And at this point, it's pretty young. You have the choice of just kind of letting it set for a little while longer. You don't really have to though, in this uh, circumstance. We are now gonna progress forward and hit our fork. So I'm gonna teach you how to do this in a bottle carbonated way and a kegged way. I don't really do much with the bottle carbed in this recipe. Like my bulk of my brew was all uh, keg carbed. So I'll still tell you how to do it and I'll have some example clips. 
So once it's racked into a new container, if you want to bottle carbonate the brew, you need to make sure that there are still viable yeast in there, which there will be because it just got done with fermentation. At this point, you can take and let it set for a little bit longer. It might just clear up some, but again, you want some of that yeast character in there, which is good. We are going to take and add specifically a non-fermentable sugar like erythritol, xylitol, stevia, something like that. A non-fermentable sugar will not be consumed by the yeast. It will just leave sweetness there. We will also have, <laughs> we'll also need to add some priming sugar. You can add priming sugar in many different methods. Here's a list of all the kinds of priming sugar. We are using a calculator to figure out how much priming sugar to add. So for one gallon, you're gonna need probably about 0.7 ounces. That's my guesstimate. I'll have a better number on the screen. And that's of dextrose. If you're using like honey, it's less or you know whatever you use. Use a calculator. We're gonna go ahead and blend together our non-fermentable sugar, our priming sugar, and you can also add, if you wanna really add some zing to this, maybe a little bit of citric acid or some lime juice or something like that to give it a little bit of brightness. Once you've blended all that together, trying to not use too much oxygen introduction, you're gonna go ahead now and bottle it. So we take a bottling or auto siphon and a bottling wand, we raise the brew up and we take our bottles that have been sanitized, get the liquid in there with the auto siphon and wand and all that, cap them, and then you wait about two more weeks roughly for the carbonation to happen. The yeast consume the sugar that is fermentable the priming sugar in the bottles creating carbonation. So it takes about two weeks to roughly get there. You can take a bottle, put it in the fridge and let it cool down and open it up and see where your carbonation level is at. But if you've used the right amount of uh, priming sugar, you should have no problems. So that's the bottle carbed way. Doesn't really continue to emphasize whatever honey you're using. So I prefer to do the kegged way. So let's talk about that. Kegging, we go backwards in time to where we had our, racked our brew into the new container. We don't need the yeast anymore since they're done. So we're gonna go ahead and actually stabilize this or pasteurize. You can do either method. Pasteurizing is the method of heating the liquid up via sous vide, via pot and water. Anyways, whatever you wanna do to get the liquid up to a certain temp for a certain amount of time to kill off the yeast. Very important that you kill off the yeast in this circumstance. You can do that. You can either pasteurize or you can stabilize with potassium sorbate and potassium metabisulfite. Both of these in conjunction work together to halt further fermentation. So super important, go either direction. We want to make sure that the yeast will not consume any sugar that we continue to add to this brew. We are gonna back sweeten this with our original honey. So I back sweetened with my raspberry blossom honey. You might be back sweetening with your clover, wildflower, orange blossom, whatever you got there. The brew, we mixed it up. Since we had stabilized and when we let it set, that's an important detail I forgot to say, we can now add that honey in. So I added my back sweetening honey in about 24 hours later. And uh, I went ahead and uh, just kind of let it set for a while longer. Once it had mixed in, I didn't do anything with acid balance, meaning my citric acid or malic acid or lime juice or anything like that yet and I'll talk about why in a moment. You can definitely add those things at that point. So we've back sweetened the brew. We still have it in our bucket. Once it's sat for about, let's say two or three more days, you don't see any fermentation. This is your time to decide, do I want to force clear this thing? Meaning, do I wanna add something like a sparkaloid, a bentonite, a um, easy clear, any of these billions of options we have, or do I wanna let it naturally clear? I chose to add sparkaloid to this which is a really great finding agent. I added that in, I waited about three or four days and it had cleared up super well. Once it had cleared up, we moved it into a keg. Now I moved this into two kegs and I'll talk about why. There is a larger keg, a five gallon keg that I did something with and I'll talk about in a moment. And then there's a 1.3 gallon keg that I moved part of it into. So I have a kegged, smaller kegged version, bigger kegged version, I'll talk about more in a second. But the forced carbonation side, if you use a larger keg, you're gonna need a CO2 tank, a regulator, a way to add CO2, about 30 PSI, into the keg for roughly two to three, two to three days. A smaller keg, similar thing, but you have a CO2 cartridge that goes on top and 
30 PSI for two to three days. Most importantly, put it in a cold chamber so that it will carbonate faster. So you can choose either fork you wanna go. Some people are gonna do the bottle carved. There's gonna be varied results, just spoilers, varied results with the bottle carved because it's not back sweetened with the same honey. So you're not gonna get the same characters that you will get from the kegged. So that's kind of disclaimer there. It's still gonna be good, but it's just gonna be a little bit different. I wanna pause and say, I didn't talk about this much, but the wine tannin we added was to help give this a little more body and more chew. This brew has to be carbonated at this low of an ABV. And that's because it's gonna be really watery without that extra lift from the carbonation. So that's why we use the tannin helps with the carbonation and the body filling out point. Let's go ahead and grab our smaller keg and taste this thing. All right, I got to cut in here because I was editing this video and realized that I can explain this better. I'm also timeline jumping because the clip that you were watching is from like three months ago and there's been a lot of stuff that's happened since then. So here's what happened. I went through a whole little series I'll show you a little clip of it, but of me talking about why and how you want to use lemon and lime juice in this brew specifically. So as you're going along, you've made the bottle carbonated version or you've made the kegged version. If you need acidity to be uh, hotter or better for you, you can add a little bit of lime juice, lemon juice, or if you have specifics, citric acid, malic acid, tartaric acid, those are kind of fancy. Um, sprinkle a little bit of that stuff in your brew until you get it to the tasting point you want it and then you know do the bottle carb method or do the kegged whichever way. I spent a few minutes in the video originally that clip before kind of uh, testing the waters. I essentially poured into four small glasses my raspberry mead that was kegged and I added a smidge of like lime juice and then lemon juice. And I kind of decided, well, lime and this raspberry honey is the way to go. That might be different for your brew. So I ended up splashing some lime juice in. And then for my bigger batch, I also added some lime zest. Lemon zest, lime zest are like underrated. People don't use them enough. That's how you get the most lemon or lime flavor. So zest, either one. Put it in your brew until you get to the flavor timing that you like or the flavor amount and then pull it out. That's the way I suggest to do it. So for my recipe, that's why I used lemon or <laughs> lime. I'm saying both of them now. So since we've been going through this weird timeline, I actually ended up taking this mead, I have one can of it left, over to the guys over at Claw Hammer Supply. I hung out with them this past week and we did a tasting of some things. They helped me with the tasting. We made a braggot while I was there. And so I wanna to hop to the tasting of this raspberry honey and lime mead real fast. All right, Claw Hammer Supply. Yeah, buddy. Kyle, Emmett, thanks you for uh, letting me crash your party for the week. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, dude, dude. thanks for coming. Give you guys it's a been, lot of uh, booze. It's been, uh, well, yeah, a feel, lot of booze. Feeling and a little rough this I morning. know you're stoked <laughs> to try more booze. Yeah. And so I've prepared only the best, I hope. Uh, okay. for you to try. So okay. we're going to start light and then we'll kind of escalate up to something a little more okay. <laughs> okay. wild. So this is a raspberry honey mead with okay. lime. All right. Zero raspberries in this other than the honey itself. All right. And it's supposed to taste like a raspberry lime mead. Okay. So what I want for you all to do is uh, rip it apart. Let okay. me know. Okay. So give me, give me the full uh, Clawheimer experience. All right. So Ooh, it smells nice. Yep. I'm curious what you think. I really like this one. Um, sometimes it's interesting. I, I think sometimes it can, but you said there's no, there is lime in it, but lime in it, there yeah. is no raspberry honey. So I think sometimes it's tough to do like lemony, limey stuff could it, because it can taste or smell like a bathroom cleaner. Yeah. But this doesn't, it has a nice fruity smell to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely smells sweet too, which is the fun yeah, thing about honey. There's a lot of- It smells sweet. It smells sweet. Diving in. Oh, I'm in. I'm already in the pool. What's fun is I have the editing powers here, so there's gonna be lots of stuff happening. Yeah, you get it. this is the drum roll, <laughs> drum roll section. All right, I got it. You I'm, got it. I'm locked in. I'm you locked in. <laughs> I'm still trying to. My brain's having a hard time, but I'm with it. <laughs> I'm locked in. What do you What do you got? Well, first of all, I love it. It's delicious. Yeah. It's a, Thank it's, you. Uh, tastes amazing. Um, it's funny that uh, so being new to mead, 
as we were talking about uh -huh. yesterday, I was really surprised by the differences in the types of honey. Mm -hmm. uh, you served us some sweet clover honey yesterday, which had has a cinnamon vibe to it. Oh yeah. And man, I was like really impressed with how unique and interesting that tasted being just honey. Right. And you know, it's just a trad meat is what you call it. Yep. Um, so I have a hard time like different uh, picking out I guess the the honey this the honey flavor in this one uh-huh um, all I can say is like the raspberry honey like I wouldn't know what that would what what I would be looking right. for you right because if, if it were just like raspberries I could say yeah I can taste the raspberries but all I can say is that it's very nice very pleasant not it's sweet but not overly sweet and there's lime there but it's not overly overpowering in any way it's super well balanced um i love it it's really really like, nice i would say if you poured me a glass this didn't tell me what it was i would think it's a soda oh, okay but, but yeah, not in like i can a, see that but not in like a like sweet soda. it just tastes like like if you went to like a local soda shop that's making sodas uh -huh. with like natural flavors like it i don't perceive like much of any booze and then the lime, and I am getting, I mean the raspberry, there is a sweetness that is hinting towards raspberry towards me, but it's not the traditional chemically or like mm. artificial raspberry that we're kind of accustomed to in a lot of flavored drinks. So it kind of is like teetering on the raspberry, but I think the lime, to me it's the, the lime's the predominant thing, but the sweetness balances it. But yeah, I'm, I'm kind of with Kyle, I don't know if I would guess it's raspberry but like since i know it is my brain right. it kind of goes that direction i think it's an easy beverage for anybody to kind of enjoy because it's there's not much to think about it's like yeah you know it's got a little bit of tartness it's got a little bit of sweetness it's really well balanced and like honestly like you you, you could like be like well it just tastes like you know a nice you know art artist yeah. artisanal um soda yeah. artisanal <laughs> <laughs> yes nailed it <laughs> Yeah, no, I hear what you're saying. So with the, <laughs> with the raspberry honey, the one thing that I noticed, it's not gonna be like true raspberries. You do get like a slight, for me at least, slight uh, berry-ish note yeah. that's in there that's interesting, plus that sweetness. It's definitely not, like you said, um, an artificial like raspberry taste or like a true even, but it's got some hints, which is kind of fun. But like you said, comparing to sweet clover, this is, in my opinion, a vastly different flavor than that sweet clover yeah. honey mm -hmm. had considering the only addition here is lime. So how many um, calories am I looking at for this? Because I'm trying to lose some weight here and I don't think this is the way to do it. You know, I think that's the that's the thing you never ask in meat is you just you just drink, you don't ask because you you don't want to know. Dude. I think the truth is you don't want to know. It's okay, first, okay. Uh, first rule about uh, mead making Fight Club. Yeah, don't ask about the calories. Mm, yeah. Well, thank you guys for helping me with tasting. Yeah, things. absolutely. Um, I, I encourage you to try some different honeys if you get a chance to, that's the fun part of it. Honeys are crazy. Yeah, I didn't know that was a thing. And we got another one we're gonna taste here in a second. All so right, let's do it, I'm let's ready. Let's do it. Thanks guys. Yeah, cheers. Now, I'm gonna jump to one more tasting. This is a, a different one. This is a coffee blossom traditional mead made in the same process we've walked through in this video, but bottle carbonated. I didn't have a bottle carbonated version of this uh, raspberry in limes, but I do have this coffee blossom, so here's that. All right, I wanna cut in here real fast to show you a bottle carbonated version. I walked you through instructions on how to do it. Here's a version of that. This is coffee blossom honey, so not the raspberry that we've been working with, but still the same idea. Fermentation occurred, of course. We back sweetened it with erythritol, and then we added some priming sugar and we bottled it. So that's what's happening here. This should be a bottle carbonated version. It's been setting for about two weeks since we added our priming sugar, so let's see what's going on here. That's carbonated. Pretty carbonated, actually. So, as you can see, it's got a fair amount of carbonation there. Looks pretty good. How does this taste in comparison to the I wanna say back sweetened with honey version or the, the real one in my opinion. This is still real. The erythritol 
which is the ferment, uh, the non-fermentable sugar that we used, still has flavor. So it has a little bit of flavor component. You do get some of this coffee blossom honey here. It does have a interesting, it's a different honey than the raspberry. This coffee honey has some uh, darker, toastier note to it, which is kind of fun. Overall, is this the same as the true honey back sweetened version? Not quite, but it's still good. Still a carbonated version, so I highly recommend you try it. Let's go back to what we were talking about. So as you've seen from both tastings, this can be really good. And it doesn't really matter what kind of honey you use because the honey is the highlight. That's the cool part of a hydromel. Obviously, when you start introducing lime and lemon and stuff like that, you're losing a little bit of the highlight to the honey, but it's still really good and really fun. I wanna make sure and emphasize the importance here. There is a distinction between a bottle carbonated and a keg or force carbonated version that's been back sweetened with honey. The back sweetening honey really helps to pronounce the flavor profile that's there. The actual, um, the erythritol we used is gonna add its own flavor profile. And I think I mentioned that before. So just know that when you do this and you bottle carb and you use a non-fermentable sugar, it's not gonna taste exactly like honey. So if you have the ability to use a forced carbonation method, if not, bottle carbonation works as well. So my last example here, this is a sweet clover traditional mead. This thing is absolutely fantastic. I love it. It's actually won some awards, many awards at competitions. It's using the same process we've walked through today with the forced carbonation method. This is just sweet clover honey, which has some natural cinnamon profile, which is kind of fun. And it's just really interesting. So I highly suggest to you get some fun honey. It could be regular clover, wildflower, whatever you have. Make a low ABV hydromel in a bottle or a keg carbonated method. Of course, make your own still meads, your high ABV meads, your fruited, all those things. But Highlight some honey, see what you can do with it. Balance it with acid balance, balance it with you know those things we talked about earlier, and go for it. So this has been a Hydromel. Sub out your honey for my recipe card. As you see on screen, you can sub out that recipe card and say, I wanna use, I don't know, avocado blossom honey. It might be kind of weird, honestly. But avocado blossom uh, Hydromel, and then you just follow the same steps, generally speaking. I hope this has made sense. I hope this has helped you in your learning of how to make a hydromel. Let me know what you think down below. I'll be back with more content and I'm super excited to share the many videos I have prepared for y'all. Thanks again. Cheers.